Uh, good evening. Let me welcome all of you here tonight. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Prodromo. I teach in the International Relations Department, and uh, I also coordinate the master's program in religion and international relations in that same department. It's a pleasure to be with all of you this evening, um, and I'd like to welcome you here uh, both on behalf of the Institute for Human Sciences and also the Department of International Relations, which are co-sponsoring tonight's uh, lecture and debate. This is actually uh, the last in a series of six debates, six lectures with European ambassadors that have occurred uh, this fall at Boston University. Um, many of you may have uh, participated in the other events um, under a large project at the Institute for Human Sciences entitled Getting to Know the European Union, Member States in Focus. And tonight we're honored to have with us uh, ambassador, the Ambassador of Greece to the United States, Ambassador Alexandros Malias, and again, once again, to have with us as a commentator and discussant, Alan Berger, who is the senior editorial writer at the Boston Globe. So it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. Uh, a brief word about the, the project itself and getting to know the European Union, member states in focus. The goal of this project has been uh, to encourage uh, uh, knowledge of the European Union at the level of the American public. And in particular, to, I think, reflect the, the unity and diversity that is the member states of the European Union by bringing knowledge to the American public about the EU as a whole, but also about the specificities of uh, individual member states within the Union itself. Now, many of the, the activities of the Institute for Human Sciences have addressed the question of what does it mean in practice to be a member of the European Union. Uh, tonight's lecture, as with those that preceded it, um, are aimed to bring the perspective of individual member states into focus when it comes to this issue of what it means at the concrete level to be part of the EU. Tonight's focus, of course, is on Greece, which became an EU member state in 1981. Uh, Ambassador Malias is, I think, especially well positioned to speak about uh, the changing face and the changing parameters of member state status in the European Union. He has a, a long and distinguished history in the Greek diplomatic corps and the Greek foreign service, and that history, his professional history of professional service, um, tracks along the growth of the, the European Union to its current 27 member state uh, status. Uh, he has, his appointments also, I think, speak in many ways to the richness and the diversity of EU member states and what it means to be a member of the European Union. He has served, for example, in a variety of appointments that include um, the head of division for Bulgaria and Romania at the Department for Balkan Affairs in the Greek Foreign Ministry. He was appointed as the first head of mission at the uh, liaison office of uh, the Hellenic Republic in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia in Skopje. Um, he was assigned as ambassador to Albania in 1999. Uh, he was national coordinator for, uh, at the Stability Pact for Southeastern Europe for a period of time for Greece. And uh, he has then culminated, I think, his uh, appointment outside of the European Union, but as part of the transatlantic space here in Washington. Um, he, I think, brings uh, the kind of knowledge that's especially important at this historical moment. Uh, as you well know, final status discussions regarding Kosovo are, are underway. Um, there has been a re-engagement around the issue of the name between the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia and Greece, uh, with the U.S. Special Envoy uh, Matthew Nimitz addressing these issues. Um, Greece has been the firmest and um, most uh, expansive advocate of Turkey's accession to the European Union, uh, an accession path that continues but is um, very adventurous, one might say. And also, he has particular expertise in questions of energy. And as, again, many of you may know, the Balkans, as part of the European Union, are emerging and are, indeed, an energy transit zone. Um, so he has a, a panoply of, of experiences and knowledge that I think really um, lead us to, to, be, to applaud the fact that he is the final speaker in this series on uh, the European Union and what it means to be a member state. So with no further ado, I introduce uh, His Excellency Ambassador Malias and uh, then uh, Alan Berger to um, enrich the commentary and discussion. Ambassador Malias. Well, thank you all for deciding to spend some uh, time in a warmer place than working outside and thank you so I think it's a win-win for everybody there are some of you here and uh, 
I don't have a prepared speech because I don't used to have one, but I'll try to use some, some notes. First, I want to show you that uh, what's outside, the European Union is just a click away. Now, how true is that? Um, European Union, above all, is the, is the strongest soft power mechanism we do have for change, reform, more democracy, more prosperity, and also more, um, how to say, synergies between uh, the countries who are not members of the European Union. So Greece um, was the first country outside the uh, Charlemagne Empire, who, who um, region that would join the European Union over a quarter of a century ago. And of course, much with the fact that Greece was a member of NATO over half a century, made Greece's um, 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 very distinguished a partner of the European Union in Southeastern Europe. Now the question, was everything so smooth? And was everything so uh, perfectly crafted? And I, I don't think so. But the fact that Greece uh, joined the European Union a quarter of a century ago, ago gave to Greece a tremendous opportunity, a golden opportunity, and Greece seized this opportunity. So the fact that Greece had um, um, very experienced and wise political leaders who decided to, to, to lead the country and the people rather than being led. So politicians that decided to, to, to behave as true leaders and not as a populist leaders, which is um, a very common feature in some of the countries who aspire ultimately to become members of the European Union, show that their decision proved to be the right one. Um, Greece, 60 years ago, was a um, totally destroyed country, totally destroyed country, following the uh, Second World War, a very hard occupation by three countries, and later an equally bloody civil war. So the um, takeoff of Greece and the reconstruction of Greece started with the end of the civil war in, in the early 50s. 50 years later, Greece is, above all, a success story. And it's the most successful story of the European Union in Southeastern Europe and, and beyond. But Greece is also, and I think I know that Greeks have a word for it, which is thavma, but it's an economic miracle. Um, right now, this year, Greece's GDP growth is 4.1%, which is the best and highest GDP growth within the Eurozone. Um, the deficit was reduced from 7.8% in 2004 down to 2.8% in 2007, which means 5% 5, 5 reduction of the, of the deficit within less than four years. Third, Greece's name has been rebranded after the Olympics, and everybody understands that the country that managed to organize the best modern Olympics, the Trump Olympics, is in a position to deliver. Fourth, Greece is a model, is above all a soft power country. A soft power in terms of uh, shaping the preferences of its neighbors. So it's not surprising that all our neighbors, both in the Balkans as well in our eastern neighbor, Turkey, want to become a member of the Euro members of the European Union. Now, what is Greece's role in that? Our role is to, to act as a bridge, as, um, as the advocate of a whole region in, uh, within the European Union. And the first strong, I would say historic, um, in terms of decisions, uh, is a landmark was the uh, European Union Council which is the summit meeting of the European Union in June 2003 in Thessaloniki. Because there, for the first time, the um, European Union leaders declared on a consensual basis that the Balkans are a part of Europe. Now, from a geography point of view, we know that. But from a political point of view, it was the first time that, that the uh, all Balkan countries, with no exception, were uh, declared as potential candidates. So each one has to seize the opportunities given. And not very often countries are given um, these opportunities uh, so often. The second is that Greece, during after the uh, collapse of Soviet Union, 
and the uh, incremental desecration of uh, Yugoslavia, realize that its northern borders, Greece has to cope with a new, new realities. Above all, new states that emerged, um, the new political borders create also economic borders, and notwithstanding the tremendous improvement in the political realities in, in, in the Balkans, still the, the emergence of economic borders deterred foreign uh, direct investment. So one of Greece's uh, primary, primary uh, strategic goals was to try to shape uh, a new market, some kind of uh, free market, customs free market in the northern borders, so that makes us today uh, very relevant in saying that both in our northern borders as in our eastern border, there is an emerging marketplace of 150 million consumers. And if you see the, uh, the um, rates of growth in the Balkans in southeastern Europe, you're going to see that it's a very interesting market now for large-scale investors. And of course, investment, economy, is not an act of philanthropy. It's based on the interest. But I think Greece's interest is met, European Union's interest is met, American interest is met. Because for the first time now, we sense again an increasing interest and increased interest of American investors to invest in this part of the world, who was fragmented, a, um, a part of the world who knew ethnic conflicts and also uh, wars. Um, Greece's economy proved to be uh, very solid, actually the, the most solid one, and Greece's businesses have uh, invested over $25 billion investment in southeastern Europe and, and Turkey. Uh, Turkey is um, an energy partner now of Greece, or if you want, Greece is an energy partner of Turkey, and just uh, two weeks ago, the Prime Ministers of Turkey and Greece inaugurated a strategic pipeline, natural gas pipeline, which will channel, will bring uh, Azeri gas from uh, Caspia to Western markets, that is EU markets and, and uh, United States. But Greece is also increasing the energy, financial, shipping, tourist and banking hub in southeastern Europe. And I want to say, or to argue, that um, in the coming five years, Greece will become the island in, of southeastern Europe. And of course, our ambitions now move, are moving beyond the, uh, the Balkans, um, in Middle East and, and uh, North Africa, countries with which Greece has always had uh, good uh, bonds. So. Uh, it's not surprising to anybody that Greece was present in the Annapolis uh, conference as Greece, as such. And uh, our policies have been uh, always uh, soft power policies, so very palatable. In terms of energy, from now, from two, uh, 2008 uh, to 2010, three pipelines will cross Greece's territory. The first is the TGI, as I told you, natural gas pipeline, Turkey, Greece, Italy. The second is crossing the territory of two NATO and EU members, Bulgaria and Greece. Is going to have, we're going to get uh, Russian crude oil, but not just Russian crude oil, Kazakh also crude oil, from uh, the Black Sea to the uh, Aegean archipelago and, and the Mediterranean Sea. This is going to be the shortest pipeline, roughly 200 miles, from the um, um, Bulgarian port of Burgas to the Greek port of uh, Alexandropolis. And this is a green pipeline, which is very much environmentally safe. The third pipeline is under discussion. It's again uh, an extension of the uh, uh, South Stream natural gas pipeline. So we see we want to diversify our, our sources of energy, trying to get both Azeri and gas, but also Russian gas. And above all, Greece's policies is based on energy policies, is based on the principle of um, dependence or interdependence. From economic view, I think the right approach is interdependence. The second is diversification of sources, 
diversification of lanes, of routes of energy, but the biggest strategic asset of Greece is not the land, is the sea. Um, our shipping industry is, in terms of ownership, tonnage and ownership, is number one at the global level. So Greece positively shapes the uh, free flow of uh, energy, of commodities and goods. And the Greek uh, tankers are the most important, from a strategic point of view, floating pipelines. Uh, just to give you an example, which I found recently, 60% uh, of China's total imports are transported by Greek-owned ships, and over 60% of China's total crude oil imports. In uh, this century, the uh, security of uh, the sea lanes and the straits is very important. It's one of the uh, top priorities of the national strategic interest of the United States at the global level, but also very much matches our own um, interests. So the um, sea lanes, their security, and their, um, and, and their role in the transportation of uh, goods and commodities is one of the strongest um, links between United States and Greece in this century. And you know, Greeks always used the sea lanes for uh, over now three or 4,000 years. On, um, I think Elizabeth said that I served some part in the Balkans. Yes, we are very close to the end game in the Balkans. And there are a couple, of maybe more than one issue, but more than one issues, but of course the most um, uh, we're coming close to the uh, end game in Kosovo. On July 10, the um, uh, EU-led Troika, which is the um, European Union, United States, and Russia, will have to deliver their own assessment to the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, and then we have to draw our own conclusions. I think uh, Greece's position is very clear. It's, it's very clear, first, the uh, Kosovo issue is, above all, a European issue. It's an, an issue that can affect positively or negatively the stability in Europe. It's not simply a Balkan problem. It's a European issue. Second, we need, um, it's good to have an outcome that will, be, that will cement stability rather than that will open the Pandora's dox, uh, box. Third. We need a solution that will be acceptable for both sides. Uh, Europe in the 20th century has suffered from imposed treaties, and some of those treaties generated wars. So we uh, advocate the need for negotiation and for um, negotiated settlements. We think also that will be important to have the outcome of this proposal by the uh, Troika um, cemented, if you want, endorsed uh, through the uh, United Nations Security Council resolution that means to have the international legitimacy. Uh, there is also a tremendous possibility now for the Balkans as a whole and for the individual countries. Um, the post-Thessaloniki agenda is again uh, here. Just last week, Greece proposed, uh, offered to, for the consideration of its EU partners, a set of ideas in order to speed up the process of EU membership for all our neighbors. Our proposal is the following. By September 2008, the European Commission will have to craft um, a roadmap for each individual country, and the European Council, which is the summit meeting at the level of heads of state or government, to take a decision in the, uh, December 2008. Now, going back to this card, the European Union is just a click away. This is true under specific criteria and conditions. And these conditions are the following. First, 
those who aspire to become members of the European Union have to play by the book, have to accept the rules that all the members of the European Union have, uh, good neighborly relations. We cannot have a country, for example, in NATO or a European Union who adopts 19th century irredentist or hostile policies. You need countries who will become reliable partners for NATO and reliable members of the European Union. Second, you need to have uh, the, Copenhagen, the Copenhagen criteria fulfilled. Uh, we must have religious and fundamental minority freedoms. If the political leaders in our neighborhood understand the importance of being a member of the European Union, they can find their own countries after many years becoming success stories as Greece was a success story itself. I want also to touch upon a question related to immigration. It's a huge program, problem, issue for the United States and for Europe. But Greece, Greece's population was increased by 10% in real terms within 10 years. And I think there is no precedent, neither in Europe nor elsewhere, to have such a real increase of your own population, in, of the population of any country in, less, in, in just 10 years. Mm -hmm. Most of uh, the immigrants who came to Greece are originating from our neighbors, Albania, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, but also from other countries beyond, uh, far from our borders. This is a tremendous asset for Greece. This is a tremendous asset because our society um, proved that it's a very open, it's inclusive, and is, um, has the force to assimilate foreign uh, migrant, foreign communities who emigrated to Greece. In terms of um, soft power product, we are, I think this century, we are witnessing a return of the, uh, some of the fundamental ideas of the classics. And I always like to say that the most modern textbook for international relations, for strategic, for strategic thinking, even for shaping alliances, alliances of the true willing, is the Peloponnesian War, Thucydides. So it's not surprising to me that wherever I travel in the United States, I see uh, more and more involvement of the students studying uh, classics. And I think this is a great thing because this is a century that where the science will make tremendous improvements, but also this is, this, uh, this is a century where the, um, the right proportion, maybe the measure and the symmetry are missing. I prefer to put a full stop here and take your uh, questions because uh, for me this is the most important part of that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start off by asking a couple of questions and then um, we'll, we'll throw it open to the audience and you can ask questions at either of the two microphones that, that, are, that are at either side of the room. You can just uh, line up and and I'll call on you. Um, I want to ask you a question about Turkey. There's been yes. uh, an evolution in uh, Greece's relations with Turkey. Um, if you'd like to sit. Yeah, you could sit. Okay. Okay. Uh, which, uh, Are you okay? okay. Yes. Um, and, um, and it's been fairly dramatic. Yes. Uh, today, Greece has very good relations with Turkey, wants Turkey to become a member of the European Union. Um, but there are governments in both uh, France and Germany that are openly um, hesitant or very much against uh, Turkey becoming a full member. Um, is Greece trying to persuade those governments to change their stance, and uh, does it have a chance to do that? Um, thank you, Lynn. I think, above all, we try to convince Turkey. Um, 
you are right in saying that Greece is the most um, generally the country of the European Union that's generally interested in engaging Turkey in the membership process. Above all, this is in our interest. I think we think it's in Turkey's interest, and I think that it's also in the European Union's interest. So it's um, in the long term, it's a win-win process. And I think it's important for the European Union as such to keep the door open. Um, Turkey has to deliver. Um, the Turkish government has made some important reforms in the terms of economy, which are undeniable, and our investors take advantage also out of this, because there's now important Greek investment in Turkey. I think that Turkey has to deliver more on the, on the uh, issue of fundamental religious freedoms. For example, the question, the question of the ecumenical patriarchate. The ecumenical patriarchate is not Greek Turkish issue. It's the symbol of religion of over 300 million of Christian Orthodox throughout the world, including millions of Americans of Greek or not, or not Greek descent. And it would be extremely helpful for Turkey to understand that it is a very strong asset for Turkey's membership. It's not a liability. On France, primarily, and Germany, we do not think that this special membership framework, which the um, France special is advocating for Turkey, is enough to speed up and to generate those reforms in Turkey, which will allow Turkey ultimately one day to join European Union. So for the Greeks, I can sum up which we think is the right approach on EU and Turkey. Full implementation, full membership. No bargains either way. Um, thank you. Uh, also, I uh, would like to ask about Kosovo, because you, you outlined what the French call the état de la question, the, the state of the, of the yes. issue now. Um, and it was, it was a complete lucid analysis. Where does Greece stand on, on um, the preferred resolution? At, at present, um, there's a kind of standoff, and the Albanian Kosovars want independence. Yes. Serbia is refusing. Russia says no independence unless Serbia accepts it. Um, and it's certainly not clear to me how this is going to be resolved. What is the, from the yes. point of view of, of Greece, what's the preferred well, solution? Um, it's a pity we don't have a map here, because I would show you that the distance between Greek border and Kosovo, as well as Serbian border, is less than 120 miles. So we feel the situation. We know the political, economic actors. We know them, because they, we are working with them, and we understand them. I can start. Reply, I will give you a direct reply, but I know very well what we don't want to see. We don't want to see uh, events out of control. We don't want to see a solution based on imposed, a, a solution will be imposed and which to our analysis will generate more problems than will solve. Anyway, history has shown that there were always more problems than solutions to the problems. We don't want to see Kosovo being united with any of its neighbors, neither annexed with any of its neighbors. And we want a Kosovo which will be truly democratic, a Kosovo which will be open, a Kosovo where the Serbs could move in the south, send the students in 
in any school of their choice, but also that the Albanians could move in the north and live together. We want a Kosovo which will be based on the principle living together and not separately. What we see right now, and I think your description is pretty accurate, we see two opposite positions. First, the Kosovo uh, Albanians will uh, expecting nothing less than independence, and the Kosovo and the Serbs, more or less, with some variations, uh, expecting I'm um, ready to go along with any solution, but no with independence. Um, Greece, Greece normally doesn't like to get advice, so I'm not here to give advice, but I think um, history has shown, and even modern history has shown, that sometimes it's better to think before we take hasty decisions than trying to rectify with the, with the errors after the decision was taken and after the implementation of Plan A was put in action. So what we do think, earnestly, is give diplomacy a fresh chance. Because history has shown throughout the world, Middle East, in Iraq, everywhere, in the Balkans, in Europe, that there is always a second chance after the last chance. This is where we stand. Thank you. Ask one other question and then um, throw it open. Um, you've talked about energy and Greece as a hub for yes. pipelines. You have one pipeline that, that comes out of Russia, um, another that avoids Russia. Russia. Yes. This is, um, I don't know if there's a, uh, there's a Greek position on this, but I'm going to ask it anyhow. After um, former German Chancellor Schroeder left office, yes. he went to work for Gazprom, the state-owned enormous energy conglomerate. It's bothered a lot of people in Germany. Um, it sets a strange precedent, I think, for the European Union and its relationship with Russia, which can have the ability to shut down, close off, um, natural gas supplies. It has done it yes. with, uh, with Ukraine um, and uh, in the Baltic region. Um, do you think that the European, European Union ought to make rules, such as we have in this country, about what a form of head of state, former head of state does after leaving office so that uh, the same kind of thing is not replicated? Um, my very frank reply is that I think uh, Chancellor Strader exactly followed the example of many American politicians. Mm -hmm. They get nice positions after the uh, let the post. So I think it's not there's nothing exceptional in that. Mm -hmm. I think it's I, I think here in the United States it's a common trend, and uh, retired diplomats find fantastic assignments here and there. Why you see? So I think Strader made this uh, decision. Um, and I think it's not up to me to judge his decision, but I think it's something that's very, 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 very common in the United States to, to get in private business. But I understand what is lying behind your question, and I prefer to, to reply to this part, which you didn't say. It's important for uh, Russia is a very important partner for Europe. Uh, you, we must understand that. It's a very important partner for Greece. Um, the energy consumption in Europe is mostly coming from, from, from Russia. What we do want as Europe is Gazprom to modernize its own system, to invest uh, both in terms of extraction but also in terms of the uh, pipelines, and we want uh, the Russian market to be more open to our own companies. So I think um, the term interdependence from an economic point of view is the most appropriate. But interdependence has to have two solid pillars, two partners. Uh, Greece's energy policies have been dictated 
by the map, by the geography. Look where is Greece. At the uh, southeastern edge of Europe, Greece joined, was linked by land with the rest of the European Union after a quarter of a century just this year because Bulgaria and Romania are two good neighbors joined European Union. So we were cut off during also the Yugoslavian wars. Uh, we were cut off our many, our, from our electricity um, supply grids. Two of them were in the former Yugoslavia in, in Croatia and Bosnia. So we were before others, we were forced to devise uh, plans to diversify our energy sources. And I'll give you another example, which is not very known. Greece is the only country in Southeastern Europe, in this part of the world, who does have over now 10 years liquefied natural gas storage and processing facilities on the basis of a long-term agreement um, with Algeria. And the Greek fleet, as explained earlier, is a global strategic asset. So um, we thought that it's in our advantage to diversify the uh, sources and the lanes and the routes of energy. At the same time, as European Union is moving towards a common energy policy, we found our, ourselves very well placed to play, um, I think, a critical role in, from the uh, Southeastern Europe. Yes. My name is Lou Urenek, and I'm a professor of journalism here at BU. Um, I, I'm wondering if I can get you to elaborate a bit on the immigration issue in Greece. Yes. When, when I visit Greece, I'm struck by the number of immigrants in the nation, black Africans in Athens. And when I go to the Peloponnesus, it seems like it's being rebuilt by Albanians. Um, and actually yes. experiencing a kind of renaissance because of all of that labor. Um, <clears throat> is it the goal of Greece, which is a homogeneous nation, to, to assimilate and integrate these immigrants into the society as citizens? Um, I'm wondering that. I'm also wondering what kinds of controls you have at your borders. Um, what I'm probing for here are the kinds of things that Greece has learned in dealing with its immigration yes. problem that might have some relevance to what the Americans are struggling with now. Yes. Um, in 1992, 1993, when this flex, influx of immigration started, we were not ready. Clearly, that, that's the point. We're not ready. We, did, we were not expecting that. This is the first time in our history that we were being through that. Normally, Greece was exporting its own people. United States, three million. Australia, Canada, and North, uh, Northern Europe. So it was the first time in our history that we saw that people were simply crossing our border to, in, in, to survive. Um, so we went through a very difficult period in the um, early 90s because we didn't have the appropriate legislation and we didn't have the know-how. I think that the society, the Greek society, acted faster and better than the legislative framework. And as I said earlier, it proved to be very open and inclusive. The second is that legislation followed. Um, we tried to deter. When you have a dilemma between survival and be between everything from the one side of the border, and nothing from the other side of the border. There's no dilemma. People will cross it. So following the failure, which lasted maybe one year and a half, of these deterrent policies, which is we increased our, our border guards, uh, we sent troops to protect the border, these measures failed 15 years ago. Then we devised a plan, and the plan was very simple. Integrate, assimilate, based on the uh, so far, still, American model of assimilation, individual, based on, on, the, on the right of the individual. And second, we try investing in our neighbors. So uh, it was two-faced, but well, I think, construed policy to invest there. So it's not a surprise that Greece is the first investor in Albania. 
I think this year we are reaching the, uh, uh, the uh, ceiling of $1 billion investment, $1.4 billion investment in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. We are no number two or three in Bulgaria, uh, in Romania, number one in, 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 in Serbia. That means that in we create jobs, I say it's not philanthropy, it's interest. In the same time, we increase prosperity, and I think Greek investment in, in the Balkans have cre generated 200,000 new jobs in an area who is known for its structural cross-border unemployment, Kosovo included. Now, going back to your second part of your question, Yes, it is our policy to assimilate foreign immigrants. Yes, they, are, they, receive, they receive free education, no fees, from the primary school up to the university, no fees. Uh, and I think so far we have started with some delay, I must accept, the process of granting citizenship, but based on the, applicant, on the application of the individual. I don't think that closing the borders is a successful means for working with your neighbors. And I think, again, the Athenian democracy is very relevant in this century, which is living together and at the same time, the concept of difference and diversity. We prefer to live together than living in parallel, as this is the case in some EU countries right now in this century. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Mayas, my yes. name is Hannah Coach, and I am an un undergraduate student at Emmanuel College here in Boston. And my question for you refers to the importance that you were speaking to earlier of international sea lanes to the yes. nation of Greece. And I was wondering what Greece's position is on the somewhat contentious issue of the Northwest Passage as it becomes a more serious issue as the Canadian government asserts its sovereignty over the Arctic lane and the U.S. attempts to declare it as an international trade. Yes. Uh, thank you. Lives, Greece lives in a region where um, um, these issues enter of course, different analogies have some uh, similarities. Say, for us, a relatively small country. Look how is Greece. Ele 11 million people. Being in position to positively shape the global trade is a big, it, it, it's something very important. There are very few countries who, like Greece, have benefited from the globalization more the markets are open, like China, more the global trade is done in a secure and well-orchestrated manner, more the markets are free, we draw advantage. I think that is important to have international law being respected, international treaties. The Treaty on the Law of the Sea is important. It's very important for Greece, as well as it is important for the United States. This is why you see now some fresh efforts for this administration to ratify the Treaty on the Law of the Sea. It was successfully passed the uh, hearings in the Senate, and I think now they're going to have a vote in the full House. So um, I think it's very important to regulate the, um, um, the rights on the basis of international law, international treaties. And Greece has always sided with the side of those who respect international law, international conventions, and international treaties, both the, those who regulate the sea, the sea lanes, and the um, seabed. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Athena. Um, I'm a student here at Boston University, and um, I took a trip to Greece last summer, and there was a lot of things that I was surprised by. Um, I'm an environmental studies major, 
And um, I was surprised about how um, green energy is integrated into the economy and into people's everyday lives. Um, I particularly was on the island of uh, Rhodes, and every house there had um, renewable energy of some, they had um, solar panels on their buildings, and I was very surprised about that. And I just wanted to cr congratulate the country for thinking green, and um, it's something that this country can learn about, because even the tiniest of islands had huge wind, um, wind uh, turbines, and I found that amazing, because it's something that in the United States we can't do that we see it as something that's not beneficial or that won't work out. And I think it, Greece could definitely you know, lend, you know, talk to our government about uh, our problems that we're having with that. Um, but my question was, um, I went there and a lot of, well, specifically in Rhodes, and I would imagine in Santorini and um, in, in Mykonos, where the, the economies are heavily based on tourism. And I was wondering um, how the Greek government is working with its citizens to make sure that the Greek citizens still get all the benefits that a lot of the tourists are seeing, because they have um, like water parks and just things like that. And a lot of the citizens can't enjoy those things because they'd be either working so hard and they can't afford it because of um, just they're not don't have enough income for it. And so they just sit back and watch tourists enjoy a lot of the the great things that Greece has to offer without having the time, money, energy to enjoy it themselves. And I was wondering yes. what the government is doing to help its citizens in terms of that. Well, um, on the first part of your remark question, I had to say that we Greeks were not satisfied from our performance as green, as you say. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we are satisfied. And we would like to see more of this green energy being an uh, important part of our um, comprehensive uh, consumption pattern in terms of energy. But it's true also that uh, Greece is gifted uh, both from the um, aeolian energy, which is the wind energy, and, and, this, and the sand. And of course, um, this year, Greece went through, um, we learned the, um, <clears throat> the impact of climate change in the hard way with the wildfires. And uh, unfortunately, I must tell you that we have to be through this very painful and dramatic disaster, environmental disaster, um, to learn that um, protecting the environment and the climate is not just the other's job. You must do it yourself. So um, there is an increasing awareness in Greece. And I think this is uh, a global, this number one global issue. Number one not global issue. Uh, so it's in, in our domestic agenda. And I think that talking here on behalf of the European Union, we would like to see um, the Kyoto Protocol being implemented and now moving be beyond the Kyoto Protocol. So uh, what you said about the um, captors and wind energy is true. But as Greeks, we want to see more of that. On the second part, tourism is our heavy industry, tourism and shipping. Tourism contributes roughly 20%, between 16% and 20% in the GDP of Greece. And it's um, uh, millions of Greeks find a job there. Um, I myself have noticed that in several parts of Greece, um, people are working exclusively out of tourism. The islands you described are, how to say, the models of tourism, Santorini, Mykonos, and others. But there are other places also, Greece, who are very much depending from tourism. Um, we are moving now from uh, the massive tourism to the, uh, how to say that, to more focused tourist policy. And uh, the next generation of tourism will be most in uh, villas, rental, high income tourism. But uh, I will not deal with you on your remark that in some parts of Greece, people are prefer to work just exclusively on, on tourism. This is, this is a fact. But this is not the only source of, of income we, we, we do have. Is it OK? Or? Um, Go ahead. Go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was just um, saying that also I, a lot of um, Greeks um, had a problem when uh, they switched over from the drachma to the euro. 
and that they saw an increase in prices with uh, the products from clothes yes. to other important things without an uh, increase also in their income for their everyday working so that things became much more, much less affordable than they were beforehand and they're having trouble also doing that. Like that's why they don't have extra money to enjoy a lot of things. A lot of the prosper like the prosperity that Greece has experienced, they yes. can't enjoy it as much as um, could. In terms of the uh, household consumption pattern, it's true that uh, the euro uh, has changed the um, consumption patterns, not just the Greeks, but also European consumers. Um, the uh, outcome was that uh, we didn't realize in the early steps of Euro, now we know, in the early steps of Euro, that Euro is 340 hundred drachmas, 340 drachmas. And we were half Euro, 50, it's uh, uh, 170 drachmas. So most often we were using the Euro like a drachma or like 100 drachmas. So it's true that uh, the uh, landing was not very soft, but allow me to say it was necessary. Because you cannot have, uh, any, you cannot be an important economic player at the global level if you don't have a common currency. So uh, it was important. The, uh, if you see now the uh, consumption pattern, you see that many households are using the plastic money, which is not surprising because this is the American model of the economy. You see that this is the pattern that um, makes the Greek banks prosper. It's, it have tremendous uh, profits. And I think also that uh, it's important that now the, both the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, as well as the national governments, with some delay, I have to, to accept that, start to make some information campaigns. But, uh, um, I will not uh, agree with the last part of your assessment that the Greeks don't enjoy their life. I think they prefer to enjoy in spending <laughs> rather than investing. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, my name is Sandy Singer. I'm a BU alumni. Um, I have a question, two questions about, well, one is security. If the people, every, everyone who's a member of the European Union can go from country to country, and everyone who's in Turkey can go to Greece with no security, does that mean that all the Turks can go to the, all the European countries? Or is there some pressure to have some kind of security on the Greece borders to prevent Turks from coming in? Um, and my second question is I'm wondering if the difficulties, um, the democracy difficulties and stuff that are existing in Turkey are generational. I mean, you have the internet. Is the next generation, the college kids of Turkey, going to be just like everybody else in Europe by the time they get to be adults? Well, yes, on, on the first point, there are only already millions of Turks in, in Europe as migrant workers, as guest workers in Germany, and most of them have also the German citizenship. So I think there are um, in, in Germany, in France, in, in uh, Netherlands, in Belgium, in, in, in Sweden. So there are already there. Um, the, uh, I'm sorry? In Austria. In Austria. Uh, surprising, there are no Turks as workers in Greece, but there are thousands and thousands of, of tourists, as well as there are many Greek tourists visiting Turkey, which is a very positive indication. Um, the board, Gre Turks are crossing Greece because we have very modern now a network of, of highways to go to, the, um, to, to Europe through Italy. So one of the most, um, uh, the, the, the route they use to go back to their jobs in, in, in Europe is through Greece. Uh, the Greek borders are the, um, are the uh, borders of the European Union. So you understand that we, are, uh, we need to have controls. And uh, a country that has 3,000 islands and islots has to have important controls throughout its own territory. I want to make a point. Greece and Turkey signed a few years ago um, so-called readmission agreement. We would like to see Turkey display a higher degree of commitment in respect of this agreement and to seal its own borders, not to allowing, uh, not to allowing 
uh, economic refugees or other kind of people crossing Turkey simply to go to European Union. And we are working with Turkey, and this is one of the uh, of, of, of core issues right now and discussions between European Union and Turkey. So uh, security is very important for us. We are a country that 20% of its income is depending of, uh, of tourism. And uh, we learned that also story through the hard way decades ago. So we are forced and willing to display a high degree of, um, of um, uh, security controls in our borders. That's my plan. And, and the second question is to whether um, the difficulties with Turkey right now, the democracy difficulties of the leadership of Turkey, is that a generational thing? Will their children, who have access to the internet and access to the rest of the world, be like the rest of the world? And, and these problems are going to go away because the young people are all going to be modern. I think the internet is. Um, I think the, 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 you have the answer. The internet is democracy in your house, is um, the news in your desk. Uh, internet is the best way to communicate. So uh, people cannot simply hide the reality. But Greece is working very closely, both with the government of Turkey, but also with the civil society. And, and, and now, I, I give, or now I'll I give a direct reply to your question. We want to show to Turkey that there is a very, um, there is a, how to say, fast track for Turkey's membership to the European Union, which is to deliver, to implement the uh, conditions uh, Turkey has willingly undertaken. Moving from civil society, for example, I want to go back to the religious freedoms, the ecumenical patriarchate, the, the need for Turkey to withdraw 40,000 occupation troops from Cyprus. That's an anomaly. That's an anomaly at the European level. It's not an anomaly because Greece says so. You cannot have a member of the European Union who has 40,000 occupation troops, troops on the territory of a member of a country who is already a member of the European Union. So Turkey has to work. No, but, but what I'm wondering about is, is there, for example, in, in Cuba, we know there's Castro. When Castro gets old and, well, he's old, but when he gets older and dies, there's going to be a, a, a new generation. Is, is the same kind of issue exist in Turkey? Well, I, I think, thanks God, uh, Turkey has very young and talented leaders. So um, I'm rather optimistic, yes. Yes. Hello, Ambassador. My name is Jason George, and I'm a undergraduate student at BU. And my question's regarding Turkey as well, but um, I was thinking back to um, an article I read in October uh, on BBC, which um, was about the Kurdish uprising in Eastern Turkey at the borders. And I was wondering um, what the Greek stance is on Kurdish self-determination, if any, um, and if like um, the Greek and Turkish um, the close relationship that you have, um, is there, do you believe that um, the Kurdish instability, would that lead to a delay in Turkey joining the EU, or would it have any, excuse me, would it have any effect? Um, what is your opinion on that? I think, above all, Greece is um, um, an axiomatic position of the European Union, Greece included, is the respect of international borders. So that's, that, that's something that is uh, fundamental. Respect for international borders, the inviolability of borders. And um, that starts for Turkey. I would have hoped that that starts for Cyprus, which is not the case. Uh, this stands also for Iraq. So um, I think I said earlier that um, Turkey has to deliver more in terms of minority rights, religious rights. Uh, at the same time, we understand that there, is a, there are some problems, important problems right now between uh, Turkey and Iraq. And the uh, United States also is involved in this uh, tripartite um, dialogue. Uh, so there's not one Kurdish question. There is more than one Kurdish issues. 
One is domestic in Turkey. I think 30% of uh, Turkey's population are of Kurdish origin, and many uh, in the uh, new parliament following the July elections, there are MPs of Kurdish uh, affiliation. Uh, I think that it will be very helpful above all for Turkey to seize this EU membership process and to um, take those measures who will allow Turkey ultimately to become a member of the European Union. I always want to reply through the European Union because that helped many members, today's members of the European Union, to cope with problems they had. So I think it's the strongest catalyst that exists. It matters. That's my reply. Thank you. Yes. Um, I wondered if I could ask a bit more about the Kosovo issue. Yes. Um, it seems to me that uh, EU discussions about the final status of Kosovo tend to be framed um, by looking to the past rather than examining the present and thinking about the future. And by that I mean that the discussion is oftentimes couched in terms of uh, former Serbian aggression against uh, Albanian Kosovars and then uh, responses by Kosovar Albanians to Serbs currently in Serbia, rather than looking at um, issues that we associate with stability and sovereignty. Um, if we think about, for example, the fact that democracies are rule of law societies with um, accountable leaderships and functioning institutions, or um, EU-style economies are those which are based on legal rather than illegal activities. Um, and if we think about um, the willingness to um, protect one's borders but also allow free passage across one's borders, again, according to um, international treaties and covenants, um, the possibilities for a sustainable state in an independent Kosovo seem quite limited at present and certainly in the, the near future. Uh, given the, the challenges then that a sustainable Kosovo, independent Kosovo would face, what accounts for um, the lack or at least the apparent lack of public discussion around these issues of state capacity when it comes to a final status solution on oh, the Kosovo yes. issue? Now, there's more than one question uh, in the service. <laughs> First, you know, um, no, no, I'll be ready to reply. I'm very happy indeed. First, Europe looks at the past. Yes, it's true, because we want, we want to draw the appropriate lessons from the past. It's not, it's not always bad to look in the past if the lessons learned should not be repeated. I said earlier that Europe, Europe in the 20th century uh, went through very difficult times and two wars. So there are some lessons learned. The second is on the um, state capacity. Uh, I think that, hypothetically, if we move towards the uh, interna independent, international monitored independence, the cost of our Albanians will realize the day after that uh, the real problems start then, the real problems. Right now, Kosovo is a kind of special case. It's a UN protectorate uh, under ANMIC. 1244 puts Kosovo within the, um, um, the um, sovereignty of, of, of uh, Serbia. Actually, Serbia and Montenegro, the FRY. Um, Kosovo does have the resources. For example, it's very rich in lignite and has the largest um, quantities, of, uh, quantities of lignite in southeastern Europe and the finest quality in terms of uh, thermic uh, performance. Now, there are some very specific terms in, in to, to qualify the thermic delivery of, the, of, the, uh, of lignite. But of course, lignite is not a source of energy that I'd recommend for Boston, for example. So if it's not good for Boston, why should it be good for the Balkans? Uh, the second is we want to see the day after an entity that could be in good terms with all its neighbors, but above all will not generate, will not be the source of troubles. This is why, again, we do believe that Europe 
has to come with fresh diplomatic effort, as we are right now, to engage Serbia in the fast track of European membership process. We need also, after Serbia, to engage Bosnia and Herzegovina. Nobody addresses the question of Bosnia and Herzegovina, though the situation is very difficult there. There is only one way to lead Bosnia and Herzegovina into the reforms who are necessary and the adaptations who are necessary, and this is through the European Union. So our, our proposals right now, I'm going to say right now, is literally right now, is to move Serbia in the fast track EU membership process, then to have immediately Bosnia and Herzegovina again in the EU, EU membership process, and to create in Kosovo today the conditions which allow ultimately Kosovo at a later stage to join the mainstream of the European family. Today, simply, it's not possible. Whoever has been traveling in Kosovo right now is going to see in Dechani the monastery. You cannot go in the monastery. You have to, to enter the, uh, some Italian troops who will lead you in a safe way there. Nathan Sahransky wrote, uh, I think, a very well-known book, which is The Case for Democracy. And in this book has a fine description of which is the ideal society where people can move freely, um, people can uh, live under the uh, state of freedom and not fear. Uh, I don't know anybody who argues that today situation in Kosovo is a situation that cements multi-ethnicity, multiculturalism, uh, diversity, and ultimately freedom. So uh, European Union, working closely with the United States and Russia, have to deliver a solution will last. But this is on EU territory. It's on EU theater. So it's above all our responsibility to deliver. Have I replied to your question? Fully or partially? Mainly. <laughs> Thanks. Are there any other questions? Um, I'm, good. I'm not sure if this is a question, it's more of a request, I suppose, but um, you were talking about Greece's soft power and you, you mentioned Thucydides as a source for understanding of yes. uh, strategic issues. Uh, there was a time, long, long, long time ago when I was an undergraduate, you almost could not get through college without reading Thucydides. Yes. Now it's hard to. <laughs> uh, I wonder if uh, Greece might uh, mount a campaign to uh, bring back not only Thucydides, but um, what used to be called the classic canon. Um, now, I have to be very diplomatic. <laughs> this is the only time I'll try to be very diplomatic. Um, in all war colleges, Naval Academy in Annapolis, in the uh, Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, at West Point, in the National Defense University, Thucydides is a mandatory textbook. Um, why? Not because this is the outcome of the Greek embassies <laughs> involved, because, because people realize that what we try to explain today has been already very accurately described in the most pertinent terms. Can I give you an example? Uh, I have this text for tomorrow in the um, New Hampshire University where we are going to address the faculty of letters. But this is one of my preferred texts. I will not take much of your time anyway. It's Um, coalitions, um, a big country which uses its might is, can shape viable alliance and coalitions or it's better to use soft power. Look what um, Thucydides is saying, in the, but also in Socrates in his speech on peace, Peri Irinis. 
we must be willing to treat our lies as we would our friends and not to grant them things only in words and not exercise our leadership as masters but as helpers. It's not Malias, it's Socrates. From Thucydides now. So we shall not lack allies to help us, but shall find many ready and willing to join their forces to our own coalition of the willing. For what city or what men will not be eager to share our friendship and our lands when they see that we are at once the most just and the most powerful of peoples? Thucydides and Socrates on how to prepare um, a political and a military expedition, how to conquer a country. And you, we can draw some parallelisms. If we undertake the war, we would, by hastening its commencement, only delay its conclusions. I think it's a very relevant. Another one, in practice, we always base our preparations against an enemy on the assumption that his plans are sound. Indeed, it's right to rest our hopes not on a belief in his blunders, but on the soundness of our provisions. Very pertinent in time. We must not rest our hopes of safety upon the blunders of our enemies, but upon our own management of affairs and upon our own judgment. For the good fortune which results to us from their stupidity might perhaps cease or change to the opposite. And others and others. I think that uh, it's in the United States that we see a tremendous return of the classics as a modern means of understanding what's happening and a modern means to remedy with what is not going well. So it's not also surprising that wherever you're going in, this, in the campuses, the fraternities are self-named the Greeks. And the United States has tremendous partners and alliance throughout the world. But there is only with one culture one country that would like to identify themselves is the Greeks. Um, it's different to represent Greece, but it's what those who are in the fraternities identify themselves as being. Also the United States, the classics, and have been at the origin, origin in this century of very important political movements, in Washington at least. Thank you very much. Thank you.